I remember back in 1973 when the Sydney Opera House had finally been built, my dad was invited to sing in an Aboriginal play, Dalgary. He prepared for months. It was the first time I'd seen him practice every day and that became the first opera to be performed in the finished opera house. That was before the official opening where the Queen opened it in October. That was his last public performance as a professional singer. Uh, I mean, Harold Blair, he was an Aboriginal tenor, uh, famous in Australia, particularly in the 50s and 60s. Uh, and um, just his story particularly inspires me um, for the way that he managed to go from uh, relative obscurity and uh, up against um, such insurmountable odds um, that Aboriginal people were facing uh, during the time of his life uh, to Juilliard for um, his singing lessons, for his rising to national fame um, as a singer and uh, around the world. Harold Blair is a perfect representation of what I would hope to be as a performer. He achieved so, so much despite his background and what he achieved at his time would still be considered amazing today and proved that First Nations people are just as competent and capable of achieving greatness in whatever realm they choose to pursue. Uh, well, I first encountered Harold when I was a student at Naista and um, Lucy Homoan, who was one of our dance teachers, brought in this trilogy of songs to sing. And then we, we started to kind of like, you know, she choreographed to these songs and she told us this was Harold Blair, who was an opera singer, who was an Aboriginal opera singer. And I was always intrigued by that, you know, because growing up where I grew up um, in the 60s, you know, and knowing how difficult it was for First Nations people in Australia, I was intrigued about how did this man from the bush get to be this world-renowned opera singer? And how did he get there? So I was totally fascinated by that. Harold Blair was my father. Um, larger than life. Um, a warm, cuddly father. He was very affectionate. It was awesome to have someone who was so charismatic, so powerful, um, and such a beautiful human being. Um, of course, you don't know that so much as you're growing up, but you feel it. You just, it, it wraps you, or it wraps around you. Harold Blair was a video on the screen. So I was 13, 14 years old in my first years of high school. Um, my grandmother, um, Nana Ruth Hegarty, um, uh, Sherberg Elder um, in her 90s now, she actually showed me the documentary that was done on Harold Blair's life. And it was the first time I'd heard opera singing. There was something in that story, in his story, that I turned to my parents immediately and went, I'm gonna do that with my life. And, and my mum sort of inquired like, what do you do what with your life? And I'm like, I'm gonna sing opera. You know, and as a, as a 13, 14 year old boy from a small, you know, regional town with no musical real background, opera was a big dream. Um, but I just knew that if, if he could do it, that I could do it. Harold Blair was my father. He was born in Cherbourg Mission. He left there when he was four months old with his mother, my grandmother Esther Quinn, and they got sent to Perga Mission. After he was about two years old, his mother was sent away to work on stations. She was allowed to see him twice a year. So he grew up by himself and the rest of the people on the mission. And it was a period in time where he was caught in two worlds. The white people didn't want anything to know with him. And then the full bloods didn't want because he was mixed blood. There was just this group of kids that were mixed growing up with each other. It was a Salvation Army mission. He didn't get an education there, but he did know the Bible backwards. Later on in life, he always donated money to the Salvation Army. I said to him once, why, did you, why do you 
have so much regard for the Salvation Army when when you grew up you hardly had anything and you hardly had any food and you had to steal food to get food. And he said, son, if it wasn't for them, I probably wouldn't be here. Even though it was very tough times, they were able to give him an opportunity to, to actually live. He loved listening to the music, so he used to imitate the singers and he used to sneak out and go to the theatres in Ipswich. One of his idols was Nelson Eddy. He imitated him and sang like him. And then once he was old enough to start working, he went off working as a stockman, then got sent up to the cane fields up north of Queensland. And whenever he was working, he was always singing. And then they had a local uh, talent quest in town. And my father sang and won the contest. And then from there, a group of businessmen got together to get money for that to go to somewhere. There was a committee wanted him to study full time. And so they asked the government if they could help. All they could do was to offer him a job as a message boy. And so they decided they would have to do something a little bit better than that, and so they decided to go to Sydney first, to the conservatorium, and they said, yes, you've got a good voice, but you're not educated enough to do it. And so they decided, well, we'll go to Melbourne. We'll try Melbourne Conservatorium. And they said the same thing. And the people that had come down with him thought, oh, what are we, what are we going to do now? And so they heard of the Melbourne Conservatorium and an interview was made and they said, yes, Harold, we will take you, but it's going to be hard work. And so they asked him if he would like to do it and he said, yes, he would like to do it. I met Harold at the Conservatorium. I was studying singing and Harold was already there doing his course, a three-year course, which they didn't think he would be able to manage. He did the course in three years with honours and he was there and saw me having my lessons and from there on it was on. <laughs> we were married in 1949 and then he went to America. Went off to the States for about 18 months and that was a huge eye-opener for him where he saw so many black people, doctors, lawyers. He loved Harlem. Like, you hear the old stories about how dangerous it was and all that kind of stuff. But that, he, he loved it. It was just being with all these black people that were achieving so much. So then he came back to Australia and decided he was going to start doing something for Aboriginal people. Um, Dad, Harold's been an inspiration in so many ways. I think most of all is his soft approach to things. He wasn't loud, he wasn't noisy. He was strong, but he was silent. And he was a strong advocate, but he was charismatic. He could walk into a room and people's attitudes would change, you know. So he brought something different in that way. And I believe that Making relationships with people is what matters to create the change. And Dad certainly did that. So in 1959, when he was with the Maury Armand group, uh, they took him out to Fulda in Germany, where the Iron Curtain was. And you weren't allowed to speak to anybody on the other side of the Iron Curtain, but there was no stipulation in whether you could sing. So my father started singing to the soldiers and the people on the other side of the Iron Curtain. They had weapons, so it was a patrolled area. And he sang Aboriginal Maranoa lullaby. And it was a great experience and uplifting for them to be able to do that to the people on the other side who gave them recognition that they enjoyed listening to him sing. Seeing the photo, it's, it's compelling the way he was looking over the wall. It would have been the first time that he'd had a confrontation like that where you've got a country segregating the Germans and 
weapons and it gave him a sense of humanity for the whole world and the things needed to be done in the world. And he didn't speak about this, but I read articles about him at Mergen, the little city town near um, Sherberg, where he advocated for the kids from Sherberg to be able to swim in the pool and to have toilets in the town for Aboriginal people. This is way before the Freedom Rides, but you don't hear about that. So again, that's that soft diplomacy maybe, but maybe not so soft in a place that was so redneck. He had a contract with the ABC, did a tour of Australia. His voice didn't hold up too well getting towards the end, but wherever he went, he started voicing his opinion about Aboriginal rights and pushing it. And he said to me that he was told, Harold, if you don't stop creating so much trouble, your career's going to be finished. But he didn't heed that and started voicing his opinions, trying to get rights for Aboriginal people. And then no more concerts, no more records, because they held him under contract and they stopped all his work. He had the most beautiful, strong voice. As a singer, um, somebody referred to it as a melting tenor. People were joyful hearing him sing. Um, He loved singing. It gave him pleasure. But there's also his voice as an Aboriginal man. He was an advocate. He used his voice one-on-one to change attitudes. He could go into an event, a conference, and just bring people with him. So his voice was able to to give people hope, but at the same time, he was struggling. His voice was always the person who was proud and strong and grounded and in control, and he did that beautifully, right up until the day he died. He was not one thing, which I find particularly inspiring. There were so many facets to him. There was the obviously the performer and the voice that we recognise, but also the political and social justice angle as well. Also just a very caring and warm man from what I've noticed. Harold Blair organised a holiday program for children from Sherberg to stay with families down south to just have different experiences. So just things like that where he really did support community and Many of my aunties and uncles actually went to Melbourne through his children's program, holiday program, to travel down to Melbourne and and be a part of that. And that was life changing for many of them. And in fact, my first year that I ever traveled to Melbourne, I stayed with, with, with one of my aunties who made Melbourne her life because of the opportunity that that camp had given her as, as a young teenager. So Harold Blair was just such a positive influence in our community to, to opportunity and to dreaming big and to pursuing talent and pursuing your goals that yeah he was really up to such a positive story around my family um, so I really drew inspiration from that for my own my own dreams. Harold Blair represents uh, an inspirational figure as someone who um, was able to overcome the shocking challenges of his time uh, whose voice alone was able to take him to some of the great stages and to be known 50 years after his death as as a great Australian talent. He lived his life seeing what singing was able to do, that there was no barrier and that it gave people hope and joy. When he sang, seeing the smile on people's faces and then especially talking to Aboriginal people the inspiration through his achievements to see that and that he had changed their lives. He paved the path for future generations to go through. He was so much more than just a singer. What he did for his people was, you know, ahead of his time. The first creative work that I did as a a full-length ballet was a ballet about Harold Blair. He was a very inspirational man and that legacy continues to this day. I was recently at Pahrumpa, which was the First Nations Conference in Adelaide, and many people spoke of Harold's legacy throughout the whole week. So I think it's an an ongoing legacy. It's not something that stops. 
it's ongoing, it's there, it's inspirational for up-and-coming singers, it's inspirational for artists. The story's not yet at an end for Harold Blair, it just continues to keep going. And I think people will always see that because it's pretty, it's pretty amazing feat. To be able to do that at that period of time is extraordinary. You know, there's a few people, there's a few extraordinary people then. Al was definitely one of them. He was a visionary, you know, ahead of his time. And also just a little bit talented.